Are we using up all of the land, topsoil, minerals, and nutrients that we need to feed the world? You know, as I've watched over these last decades and analyzed fossil fuel-based industrial agriculture, I, I've realized that not only is there a violent mentality of being at war with the earth, but there's also an ignorance about how renewable systems renew themselves. They have cycles of renewal. You'll have water forever if you allow the hydrological cycle to work. You will have fertile soil forever if you give back to the soil. You will have minerals forever if you allow soil organisms to produce all the minerals. Basically, what we've done is use a non-renewable fossil resource, made non-renewable toxic chemicals from it, and then the destructiveness of fossil fuels and chemicals is destroying the renewability of our soils, of our minerals, of our water, of the biodiversity and the seed. So we've taken the renewable and made it non-renewable by depending on the non-renewable, both as the imagination, as well as the main organizing principle. How close are we to running out of food for parts of the world? If you think of the fact that a billion people are hungry, it's not that there isn't enough food to feed them. We've created such an unjust system that is denying people their right to food because we've stopped thinking of food as, as the right of all, food as a currency, and we're seeing food as a commodity. Uh, and the data from the UN was showing that with the lockdown of COVID, the hunger pandemic is going to be much worse than the COVID pandemic. It is going to kill more people. The FAO and the World Food Program were saying it. But when you ask, you know, are we running out? I already mentioned that what is privilege is industrial agriculture, but it only gives us 20% of the food, and yet it's using 75% of the world's land. Yeah? So it, it, it uses a tiny bit. Uh, it gives us a tiny bit of the food, uses most of the land, most of the food we eat comes from small farms that use hardly any land. Most of it is in women's hands. But that's not the end of the story. That 75% of the land under industrial agriculture is responsible for 75% of the ecological destruction of the planet, whether it be desertification of soils or the disappearance and pollution of water or 50% of climate change. And 75 to 80% of biodiversity extinction and in the case of insects, much, much faster. So if you just take a, do a rough calculation, if 75% destruction is coming from a food system that's giving us only 20% of the food, if this industrial food system grows to be 40%, it will create a dead planet because 75% destruction will become about 100% destruction. So we will totally run out of food, but also the food producing potential of the earth. And that is, to me, the extinction crisis. What is deforestation? What is the cause? Why is it important to stop it? Well, deforestation comes from a mindset that every bit of land should be used for profits. And, um, and even forests should be just used for monocultures and clear felled. And why is the Amazon the Amazon? It should be growing GM soil. Um, my own involvement in the ecology movement began in the early 80s when a beautiful movement started in my region. And I'd seen a forest disappear and a stream disappear. And I said, I'm going to volunteer with the Chipko movement. Chipko means to hug. Uh, so Chipko became a response to deforestation. Uh, the cause is greed. The cause is a mindset that thinks in terms of A, monocultures, two, extractivism and profits. And C, is absolutely indifferent to what a forest truly produces. And my beautiful sisters changed the slogan. They said, forests don't give us timber and profits. The forests give us soil, water, and pure air. So forests are important because they are the very basis of life. What's the relation between the biotech and chemical industry 
and the governmental agencies that oversee them? Well, the governmental agencies are supposed to oversee them. And when we started writing the regulations on biosafety under the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, which was signed in Rio in 1992, the governments were regulating these companies. The only country where they weren't being regulated is the United States. And the US never signed the biosafety protocol and it never signed the GMO labeling law. And that's why in America, there is no law for GMO labeling. And they keep playing tricks. They prevented Vermont from having a law. And now they have bioengineered label, which tells you nothing about is it genetically engineered or not. So basically as the corporations have spread, this takeover of government has spread. And you know, I, I've had so many protests, I've joined so many protests against uh, you know, the prevention of Americans the right to know what they're eating. And there was a dark act, you know, Pompeo had led it through Congress. And it was called the dark act, the denial to Americans of the right to know. And it didn't matter. It didn't matter whether it was a Republican president or a Democratic president, but they were all acting for the biotech industry. Sadly, as they spread around the world, they have corrupted more and more governments. And instead of the governments regulating them, they are now undermining regulation. But I am so happy. Yesterday, I did a big webinar with colleagues from Mexico, where they're saying we will phase out GMOs. Corn is too precious for us. We will not allow corn. Uh, Peru had an entire referendum and then the Congress passed and then the president gave a seal and they asked me to write a letter to the president. They asked me to do a seminar. Peru has said another 15 years, we will not have GMOs. So wherever there's democracy, independent governments, there are no GMOs. Wherever democracy has been killed, independent governments have become corporate governments. The corporations control the governments. How is force being applied through chemicals? Well, since the chemicals in agriculture are war chemicals, the first element of violence is built into the material nature of these chemicals. They are war chemicals. And for anyone who's forgetting this, please read Rachel Carson's Silent Spring again. Read how she's talking about this war mentality and this clumsiness against the creative fabric of nature to use war chemicals to destroy and rupture nature and make spring silent. But they're also violent because nowhere have people said, give us chemicals. I did the very detailed study of the Green Revolution in India and wrote the book called The Violence of the Green Revolution in Punjab and realized that the violence of Punjab was because of the chemical farming. Because they destroyed the soil, the water, and the economy of the farmers, and the farmers rose in protest. And then there was violence. And then the vicious cycle of violence kept growing till our fo former prime minister, Indira Gandhi, was assassinated in this vicious cycle of violence. I have studied how India didn't choose the Green Revolution. It was a violent imposition by the World Bank and IMF and the Rockefeller Foundation, so it's violent. Individual farmers never wanted the fertilizers. They were told if you want to repair your roof and you want a little bank credit, but before that you have to show you both, took the fertilizer. So you have to have proof that you're using fertilizer to live your normal life, send your child to college or school. So conditionalities were put on countries like India and they were put on the individual farmers. That is violent. And then the final violence is, I wrote the book on the Green Revolution the narrative gets spun. They change the narrative from being a farmer's protest into being about religion and make it look like it's about a religious conflict. It's not. Even now, as hundreds of thousands of farmers are protesting still, it's the biggest strike in human history. They still can give it a twist. It's about religion. It's about extremism. It's about this. It's about that. And, you know, when we shut down the World Trade Organization in uh, Seattle, I remember Zolik, who was the U.S. Trade Secretary, Commerce Secretary, he actually wrote an op-ed in the International Herald Tribune saying anti-globalizers are terrorists. So it's so easy to call anyone a terrorist, yeah? 
those of us who defend Mother Earth with love, those of us who defend our cultures and our freedom, our seed freedom, our food freedom. So the spin is violent. Fake news is violent. You know, fake narratives are violent. And that's why the subtitle of this book of mine, Oneness Versus the One Percent, is Shattering Illusions, Seeding Freedom. Illusions are violent. What has the reaction been to your books, lectures, and films from the media, from universities, scientists, government, and industry? Well, you know, most ordinary people who care for the earth, care for their health, care for democracy, thank me a lot for writing books. I don't write books because someone pays me to write a book. I write book because for me, it's both clarifying my own ideas, responding to a challenge and a puzzle. Like for me, Green Revolution was a puzzle. Borla gets a Nobel Peace Prize, but Punjab has violence. So where's the peace? So I wanted to understand where's the peace, yeah? Green Revolution is supposed to feed the world. Chemical farming is supposed to feed the world. There's hunger. Why is there hunger, right? Who really feeds the world? So my books are really solving puzzles that, you know, there's a propaganda machine telling us one story and there's a reality that tells me something else. Over the years, I've seen a very big shift in media. You know, when I started the work on GMOs, primetime TV, it was amazing, the failure of BT cotton in India, farmers' suicides. And then the media houses started to get threats. Yeah, if you call her again, we're going to withdraw advertising. And then, of course, the media has been bought over. I mean, there's articles about how Gates controls all the media today. How has industry responded? You know, I feel, I feel sad because they take one little individual with one bit of research and then they put an army of trolls, an army of public relations people and they work over time to change the Wikipedia page to say I never studied physics, to constantly attack me and attack me and attack me. But, you know, I've never done any of this work, either for glory or for any gain. I've done it for seeking my truth and living a life of right action. So I've, I know I've faced the attacks like one would in any other situation. And I'm grateful to all the other thinking people who appreciate independent thinking and want to defend seed freedom and food freedom like I want to defend it for all life. Why was it important for you to come back and speak here at the Real Truth About Health conference? Well, the real food about health has four words, three of which are so central to my passions, real. In a time where we have fake news and fake food and fake science, real becomes very important. And again, post-truth world, truth becomes that very important. And the highest post-truth right now is around food and health. And therefore, the Real Truth About Health Conference is an important place to be for all whoever can join. Thank you. We are so very thankful for your incredibly courageous stand for the planet and for all of us, and especially for all of your time here today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Good to see you again, and we'll see you at the conference. Bye-bye. Thank you. Be well. Thanks.